Our scripture reading this morning comes from the fourth chapter of the letter to the Colossians, beginning in verse 7. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, the faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you about everything here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, greets you. These are, only, these are the only ones of the circumcision among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Jesus Christ, greets you. He is always wrestling in his prayers on your behalf so that you may stand mature and fully assured in everything that God wills. For I testify for him that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you read also the letter to Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you complete the task that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains, and grace be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everybody. It is good to see you all this morning. My name is Eric. I am one of the pastors here, and uh, super glad that you're here with us. Uh, that is my son. I don't usually know when a child is making noises, because you know, most of the time when it's, when it's everybody else's kid, I don't notice it, but, but my own child, I do notice it. Sorry, bud. Sorry you're disappointed. All right. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. So good to see you all here. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here. Today, we are finishing up our series in the book of Colossians. We spent the last six weeks studying through this letter that Paul wrote 2,000 years ago to the church in a city called Colossae in a region called Laodicea. Now, the last six weeks, my goal was that not only would we read the letter together, not only would we uh, hear sermons from it, but I also wanted to give you guys a little bit of training, some tips and tricks on how to study Scripture, uh, not only to just hear it be said, because as your pastor, that's part of my role, is to help you all learn to read and understand the Scriptures for us. So we spend a lot of time talking about, as we read through a book, what do we do with it? And I told you that one of the key things that we do when we read scripture is to read it and to reread it and to reread it and read it again and again and again over a lifetime. Scripture is designed to be ingested and to fill our ears and heart over and over and over again. And it is impossible to get everything that a book or a text has to offer from the first time studying through it. No matter how much you try to dig in, no matter how many books you read, it's impossible to understand everything just through one read-through. So we're invited, actually, by the scriptures to read them over and over and over. So that's the key, is that we have to read and reread this. That's why I challenged you uh, way back at the beginning, the first couple weeks, to try to read it every day. It takes, the letter to Colossians takes about 15 to 25 minutes to read, or if you're listening to an audio Bible, um, and so it's really easy to listen to it several times and begin to uh, put some pieces together. As we read through the beginning of the book, I showed you some tips and tricks on how to begin to process what we're reading. So if there's a repeated word or idea, you highlight it or underline it in your Bible. If uh, there's something that Paul says, hey, this is why I'm writing this to you that's really important, highlight it, underline it, do all the things, make all the notes. Uh, to outline the scriptures, if there's lists of things, to actually put the number by what the, the order that it is so that we can kind of keep track of the scriptures. And all of that work is to answer a simple question. What does this passage say? That's the first question that we ask when we're reading scripture. What does this book or this passage, whatever it is that we're reading, what does this say? Not what is the spiritual meaning of it, not what am I learning from this. What does this passage say? 
And so we outline and we list and we highlight just to learn what it's saying. And then the second question we ask is, what is God teaching me through this passage? And we know that we can use the law and the gospel to help apply that. That's what we talked about last week. We can use the law and the gospel to help us understand how the passage is getting us to Jesus, how it's revealing Jesus to us. And so today, we're actually looking at the very last few verses of Colossians. So I invite you to go ahead and grab the Bibles from the seats in front of you. Colossians is in the New Testament. It's toward the very end. So you're just going to have a few pages uh, at the end before it's Colossians. I think it's page 150 in the New Testament, if I remember correctly, or somewhere in that neighborhood. So go find 150. We're going to be in Colossians 4, beginning in verse 7, and we get to do this exciting work of reading a bunch of names. That's what we get to do this morning. Uh, We're in this uh, particular passage that is a lot like a laundry list of uh, names and people and stories that some of them we know some things about, some of them we don't know any. It's a little bit like reading one of the genealogies. Have you ever tried to read the Gospel of Matthew or maybe some of the Old Testament historical books and you get to just a genealogy, a list of names, and you're thinking, what in the world? Why is this in the Bible? Why do I need to know this? Why do I need to know that this is the son of this and this is the daughter of that? Well, we're going to find that out today. Um, And when we get to passages like this, lists of names, genealogies, this is actually where we kind of get into some of the uh, deeper level kinds of Bible readings. Because lists of names, just on the surface, don't seem to have a lot of meaning to us. Sometimes uh, some of the genealogies have a lot of meanings on the surface, but oftentimes it takes a lot of reading and a lot of rereading and a lot of connecting to really unlock what we're seeing in this list of names. And so this is like the third, fourth, fifth level depth of when we read the scripture over and over and over again. So it's like not the thing that you're going to catch on the 100th time you've read through it, but like maybe the 101 or 102, right? Like after you've read it a hundred times, you may start to connect some of these names and places and all this kind of stuff. So that's what we're going to do today is we're actually going to look at this passage that's really, really neat. And so we begin this way. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, So you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. So the very first person that he lists here at the end is Tychicus will tell you everything about me. So this guy named Tychicus, which is kind of a funny name, and oftentimes in the Bible there are some funny names, right? Because they're either Hebrew names, Greek names, and we try to translate them into English and it seems kind of weird. But that's his name, and he seems to be the person that Paul sent with the letter to deliver the letter to the church in Colossians. I'm sending Tychicus to you. He will tell you all about me, and he will fill you in on all the details. Tychicus is this first person. He's dealing with logistics here. This is the guy that I'm sending to you to deliver you this letter. Paul continues on in verse 9. He is coming with Onesimus, the faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, and they will tell you about everything here. Now, if you've read through the scripture several times, especially if you've read through the letters, does the name Onesimus, that tickle your ears a little bit? It might, because there's actually a little itty-bitty letter uh, a couple of pages after Colossians called Philemon. It's one chapter long. It's the shortest letter we have. And the letter to Philemon is Paul writing to a guy in Colossae named Philemon, urging him to welcome back a runaway slave named Onesimus. So Onesimus is traveling with Tychicus because Onesimus ran away from Philemon. Both Onesimus and Philemon are believers. Onesimus ran away from Philemon, sought out help from Paul, and Paul sent Onesimus back with a letter urging both Philemon and Onesimus to act in particular ways based on the gospel. And in the letter to Philemon, Paul tells Philemon to treat Onesimus as a beloved brother. That's what he actually says in that letter. So you can see here where the first time you read through this list of names, the name Onesimus probably doesn't mean anything, right? Maybe the first 10 or 20 or 30 times you read through this list of names probably doesn't mean anything to you. But if you've read through the New Testament several times, 
you might catch it and you go, oh, I know that name. You can go back to Philemon. You can read through Philemon, kind of see what's going on here. So we see that Paul's dealing with there's some logistics going on with Tychicus delivering the letter. There's also some relational stuff that he's dealing with, sending Onesimus. And then we continue on. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. Uh, so this is another person we don't know that much about Aristarchus. I think this is one or maybe one of only two times that his name is ever mentioned in the New Testament. We don't know much about him except that he's in prison with Paul. That's what we know. As does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Now Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, some of you, if you've read through the New Testament several times, that might prick your ears. Because we know if you read through Acts, you know that there in the middle of Acts, there's the story of a young man named Mark, who's the cousin of Barnabas. And Barnabas and Paul and Mark are traveling together and they're planting churches. They're doing missionary work. They're proclaiming the gospel all across the Mediterranean. And something happens that Mark leaves Paul and Barnabas and goes back home. So he stops his missionary work. Paul thinks that Mark ought to be just sent off and not proclaim the gospel anymore at all. Barnabas says, no, let Mark deal with his stuff, and then he can come back and proclaim the gospel. And it actually created um, relational uh, drift between them. They split up, and they no longer did missionary work together after that because they disagreed over what to do with this young man named Mark, who was the cousin of Barnabas. So again, you may not catch that on the first time, but if you've read Acts several times and then you run across this, you think, oh yeah, I remember that story. You can go back and hunt for it, read through Acts 15 and see all the ins and outs of that story. And so uh, Paul here is actually really interesting. He says, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. So some, for some reason, Mark is back preaching. He's back on the circuit. He's traveling from uh, Jerusalem and Palestine, kind of where he was located, to visit churches. Maybe he's just a traveling preacher. Maybe he's uh, gathering resources for the Jerusalem church. We don't really know. But Paul says that the Colossian church should welcome him, to be hospitable to him. So in the background, there must have been some sort of reconciliation, that they've received instructions about Mark and that they are to welcome him be hospitable to him. We continue on here in verse 11. And Jesus, who is called Justice, greets you. These are the only ones of the circumcision among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. So he's talking about Mark here, and this guy named Jesus, also called Justice. Little side note, this is for free. I won't charge you for this. The name Jesus was actually quite popular at the time of Jesus. Uh, it's an Aramaic name from a Hebrew name, Yeshua, which is what we, what we call Joshua. So the Old Testament character, Joshua, his name is Yeshua, and so Jesus' name in Aramaic is Joshua. And just kind of through translation, as Christianity spread in Europe, Germany, up through Scandinavia, through England, and kind of came to the United States, uh, Jesus is the English name for the name of the Christ, of Yeshua, of Nazareth. And so here we have this uh, person who also is named Yeshua. His name is Jesus. And they call him Justice, probably because he was a Roman citizen. Justice is a Roman name. And so when you're a Roman citizen, if you have a particular ethnic group, like if you're a Hebrew, you would have your Hebrew name and your Roman name. So that's probably what's going on here. Chances are, they probably called him Justice regularly just to avoid confusion, right? Because when you talk about Jesus, they wanted to make sure that they were talking about Jesus the Christ. So they probably call him Justice regularly just because it's easier that way. And so he's a Jewish believer among the circumcision that has been a comfort to me. So he says, hey, also my buddy, Justice, he says hello. He's been hanging out with me. He's been a comfort. And he says hello and God bless. We continue on. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. Uh, Epaphras is actually uh, somebody that we got introduced to in chapter one. He was the guy who planted the church in Colossae. He was the pastor who started the church. And so he had preached to them, and at some point he had left, and now he's probably off doing something else, preaching uh, somewhere else, or starting new churches, doing missionary work. But Paul has run into Epaphras, and he writes this greeting. Epaphras, your old pastor, whom you loved, he's wrestling for you in prayer. 
He wants you to be mature, and he wants you to know God's will. So it's kind of a nice like little, hey, your old friend says hello, and he's praying for you. We continue in verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Luke probably pricks your ears again. Uh, he's the guy who wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts. So he wrote the book of Acts as well. He traveled with Paul. We read about this in Acts. He traveled with Paul in the missionary journey. And uh, I don't know why they keep calling him a physician, but that comes up several times. They just keep referencing that he's a, he's a doctor. Maybe that helped distinguish him from somebody else. So Luke says hello. They don't, probably don't know Luke. Maybe he's been there a couple times. I don't know. But uh, we don't have a lot of indication that Luke went to Colossae himself. But he says, hey, Luke, the guy that you know that wrote about Jesus, that wrote one of the Gospels, he says hello, and so does Demas, and we know nothing about Demas. It's just a name here, right? Demas, also a friend, says, hey, how you doing? And then Paul says, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea, and that's the region that Colossae is in, and to Nympha and the church in her house. So Nympha is this lady who hosts one of the churches in Colossae. Early on, you know, the church didn't have buildings like this, and so they would meet in houses. So in one city, there may be several house churches that are all in relationship with one another, and Paul has written this letter probably to one house church in particular, but he also gives them the instructions to read it to all the churches in Laodicea, and he also gives this greeting to a lady who hosts one of the churches, a patroness of the church, uh, and she says, hey, Say hello to Nympha, give my greetings to her. God bless her and the church that she helps lead in her house. Give my greetings to them. Verse 17, and say to Archippus, see that you complete the task that you have received in the Lord. We don't know that much about Archippus. Uh, probably what this is, is he's the pastor at this church now. That's probably what it is. Uh, he's the new pastor after Epaphras. And so Paul's like, hey, Archippus, you have been given a task, you've been called to that church, complete that task. Keep, keep doing your work. Paul says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains, and grace be with you. So you get this list of names. Say hello to this person, this person says hi, this person did this, this person's going here, doing that. Hey, you've heard about this guy, so when he comes to you, do this. It's all this kind of strange, like, logistics and personal relationships, and it's a little jarring, to be completely honest. As we read through Colossians, it's such a little book, such a little letter, and earlier in Colossians, Paul is giving this amazing theological treatise on the work of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ fills all, and he's in all, and he's the fulfillment of all things, and he's bringing all things together, he holds everything together. Remember back in chapter one, the, the purpose that he wrote is that the Colossian believers would be mature, that they would know God's will. He proclaims the gospel that God and Jesus Christ has plucked them up from the kingdom of darkness and has placed them in the kingdom of his beloved son. He encouraged the Colossians to put on Jesus through their baptism and that the daily they can set their minds on the things of God and they can take off their old selves and put on their new selves and be mature in love, and then all of a sudden it's, oh, and hey, by the way, say hello to this person. That person says hi. This person gives you their greetings. All right, see you later. Like, it's a little jarring as we get to the end of this letter. And when you read it through the first time, or the first 20 times, or 100 times, you think, all right, the first three chapters, even a little bit into the fourth chapter, I can really get into. This makes sense. This is really good stuff. And it helps me understand how to live my life, and it's very practical. And you kind of get to the end, and you go, oh, okay, I'll just kind of buzz right over this. And maybe the first several times you read it, you just kind of read through it and don't know. Maybe you recognize some of the names, but you just keep going. And so as you keep reading and rereading, you begin to make those connections. And what I think it does, it actually unlocks for us that for Paul, he spent 11 verses just talking about people and the stuff going on in their lives. 11 verses talking about individuals and the stuff that they're doing and what they want to say. And in these uh, 11 verses, there are 10 people that he mentions, we get all kinds of backgrounds. 
We get great joyous friendships and support through the ministry that Paul experienced. There's been betrayal because of Mark and Onesimus, and there's been some redemption and forgiveness in Mark, and Paul's sending Onesimus back to repair this relationship that he has, and there's all these ins and outs, up and ups and downs, joy and suffering and difficulty and good and bad, and we miss it if we read over it too quickly. But if we take some time to reflect on all the different ways that these people are living and all the stories that they come from, we begin to realize that I think what Paul's inviting us into is to understand that God's grace infiltrates and takes place in all of these little things, in the logistics of traveling and delivering messages to people, of broken relationships and forgiveness and redemption. He sees God's grace in all these ways, the domestic life of just taking care of a small congregation meeting in a house. There's, there's this work of God and all this little stuff. This little, mundane, everyday stuff. And God has placed us in the kingdom of his beloved son. We're invited to dig roots into this kingdom. And if we're placed into a new kingdom, that means that there's nothing in our life that is not part of that kingdom. That is not taking place under the grace of God. I think Paul is encouraging us here, especially with this last phrase, simply, grace be with you. Grace be with you. Live your life, do your business, take your travels, do what you need to, and do it all under the grace of God. And so this invites us to reflect on our own lives. How has God given me grace through the good and the bad, through the joys and the sorrow, through betrayal and redemption and everything in between. As we look into other people's lives, how is God's grace seen there through the good and the bad and the joy and the sorrow and the betrayal and redemption? I think that's what this is inviting us into. And this week as I was studying this passage and just looking at these names and thinking about their backgrounds and just putting it all together that it just seems such a scattershot of the normal kind of mundane human experience. I couldn't help uh, but think about my uncle. Uh, he passed away three years ago, uh, my mother's brother. And um, when he passed away, when anybody, when anybody dies, it's an opportunity for us to reflect on how God impacted their life and how God filled their life and led them and matured them. And I grew up... Uh, you know, loving my uncle and seeing him a lot of times, and he uh, was significantly older than my mother, so even by the, my first memories of him, he was still, you know, middle-aged or over, and uh, he's a good, my mom's maiden name is Cartmill, and, and my uncle is a good Cartmill, short and stocky, right? Short and broad and a hard worker, um, loved his horses and, and took care of his family and, and did uh, led, a, led a great life, but I always thought he moved slow. That was like one thing that I like remember being a child, thinking that my uncle was just kind of this short, stocky, kind of plump, and he just kind of moved slow to me. And when he died, it was an opportunity for our family to talk about his life. And, and again, a lot of the things that happened in his life uh, happened before I can remember, and I didn't always hear about them until later. And... Um, and it unlocked a lot of things for me. Because uh, he was a man who grew up in a very secure, quiet, conservative, rural Kansas household. Um, but out of college, he and this uh, girl that he was seeing, uh, she became pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, so obviously that's a big deal in the middle of the 20th century and uh, for this small conservative family. And so they rushed to get married. Uh, they got married in a hurry. And soon after that, he felt called to ministry. So he went to seminary and studied seminary, and they had a second child. And uh, he went off into the church, and he served in United Methodist Church for several years as a pastor. And 
soon the marriage relationship began to crumble and kind of fall apart. And so he actually left ministry um, when he was getting a divorce from his wife. And soon after that, leaving ministry, you know, he worked here, worked there. Uh, uh, and in that time, actually fell into alcoholism. So he began drinking heavily, using it as a crutch, became addicted to it. Uh, he got remarried, and over uh, and the, the woman that he got married to is who I you know really know as my aunt, and she had several kids, so he welcomed them into this family. So they had this blended family, second marriage, and uh, he kind of got hopped around a little bit with his work because the drinking kept being a problem. He couldn't really hold down one place for very long. Uh, soon, just through acquaintances, he got connected with AA and got redemption from alcoholism. Began serving in AA as a mentor and a sponsor. Uh, he served diligently in his church. He never became a pastor again, uh, but he served by guest speaking and serving on boards and all that kind of stuff. So was once again very involved in the ministry of the church. Uh, and so by the end of his life, you could look back and you could see this trail of God's grace. That it wasn't easy. And in fact, I remember driving home from his funeral with my sister. It was just her and I in the car. And we were talking about all these things that had happened to him. And I said, you know what? For anybody else, that could have crushed them. A child out of wedlock, going into ministry, having to leave ministry almost in disgrace because of this divorce, of having alcoholism and recovery. You know, anybody else, it could have crushed them. Um, but my uncle lived his life heavy under God's grace. And I remember thinking, that's why he moved so slow, <laughs> is because he was heavy, heavy under God's grace. And that's what Paul's talking about here. And all these ups and downs, this just tapestry of experiences, some of them good, some of them bad, it's all part of God's grace for us. We're invited to reflect on our lives as part of the kingdom of God. And that everything fits. Everything apart is a part of God's movement of grace toward maturity, toward fullness, toward health. And if we can pay attention, we can be like my uncle. But although he experienced some hard things, although he was nearly crushed by many things, he could look back and he could see and respond to what God was doing. He could see God at work, even through the hard things. That's what we're invited to do. So we hear about Tychicus and Onesimus and Archippus and all these characters, and we look back at our own life and we think, how has God's grace been with me? And the good and the bad and the betrayal and the redemption. How has God been in with my family in the good and the bad and the betrayal and the redemption and everything in between? And what we see is that God is at work always at work. And he is heavy with his grace upon us. So my invitation to you is to watch, to be attentive, to understand that grace is at work in your life, that God is continuing to move you toward maturity and toward love. Let's pray. Well, Father, I'm grateful for your gifts to us. I'm grateful for how good you have been to us. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of Jesus Christ to um, not be left to our own devices, not be left to the tyranny of our own minds and hearts, uh, to not have to rely on our own strength or rely on our own goodness. Uh, Lord, but to hear that we are loved, we are accepted, and that we are redeemed. Lord, thank you for the freedom that that gives us. Thank you for the freedom of cleaving ourselves to you, of relying on you, of listening to your voice. Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes and reveal your grace to us. Help us see how all these ins and outs, good and bad, everything in between, is all part of your grace, the movement of your grace. Lord, I pray that you would create in us love, that you would create in us hope, that you would create in us the fruit of the Spirit, that we may have 
love and the joy and the peace and the patience and all the rest. Lord, help us trust that you're doing that work and that we don't do it ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, at this time, I lift up to you um, our country, our state, and our leaders. Lord, we lift up to you President Biden and Governor Pritzker. We lift up our local representatives and senators um, and our local officials. I ask you, Lord, that you would give them your Holy Spirit and guide them. Uh, Lord, we pray that as the prophet says, that uh, justice would roll down, uh, that uh, you would create this place to be a just and good and upright place. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would create in our country, in our state, in our communities, uh, a place of peace um, where we can flourish and uh, those who are sick are healed, um, those who are poor are lifted out of poverty, um, those who are in need um, have their bellies filled. Lord, um, we lift up to you uh, our service members, our veterans. Uh, we ask you, Lord, that you would uh, rescue them from violence, that you would rescue them from the pain and the trauma of war, that you would rescue them from the pain and the trauma of combat. Lord, for our service members, we pray for peace and safety. Uh, for our, our, both our current service members and our veterans, we ask you, Lord, that you would provide resources necessary to have mental and spiritual and physical health. Uh, Lord, we also ask for peace around the world. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would turn the hearts of our world leaders to you. Um, and Lord, that you would create peace here on earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, at this time, we lift up to you our church and its leaders for myself and for Pastor Phil, uh, for Kelsey and Danny and Patrick and Caitlin, for our ministry staff. Lord, I ask that you would continue to guide us and lead us. Give us your Holy Spirit. Uh, lead and disciple us as we lead and disciple our congregation. Uh, Lord, we thank you for Pastor Drew and uh, his coming here. Uh, I ask you, Lord, that you would bring him and his family safely here at the end of the month. Uh, Lord, that you would uh, help them feel welcomed here and settled in quickly. Um, Lord, help them say goodbye to their current church well. Um, and we ask you, Lord, that you would uh, bring, them, bring them to us safely. We look forward, Lord, to... Um, Many years of ministry, of partnering with ministry, in ministry with Pastor Drew and Megan, and uh, ask you, Lord, that you would bless them. And Lord, I lift up our leadership team to you. I ask you, Lord, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, give them wisdom and guidance as they uh, talk about uh, and partner with the staff and the ministry team leaders um, to lead and guide our church. And so, Lord, I pray that you would lead and guide them in that way. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord, I lift up to you at this time, our church family and our community, for John and Dessa Caravan as they recover from COVID, for Chrissy Smith and her health, for Carol Sisson and her health, for Eleanor Dale and her health and rehab. And we also lift up um, how, uh, Harold to you as well, that you would um, uh, give him health as well um, through that. For Lori Brogan's grandson and his recovering from COVID, for Don and Cheryl Steint as they recover from COVID, as they've been battling it back and forth uh, for many weeks, we pray, Lord, that you'd rescue them from that. For Janice Eisenman and her granddaughters as they recover from COVID, uh, Lord, we lift up the Devers family to you, the passing of Junior. We ask you, Lord, that you would uh, help them grieve well and help them cling to your promises of resurrection. For Kanae Hampton and her surgery recovery, we ask you that you would... Uh, uh, heal her body. And for Marilyn Hart and her health, uh, she looks forward to procedures and tests in the coming weeks, Lord. We ask that you would lead and guide her. And Lord, we are so grateful that you have, uh, that you are a God who wants to heal, that you are a God who desires uh, to bring us to fullness and to health. Um, and Lord, thank you for working the miracle of healing. And thank you, Lord, for using the things that you have created uh, to do this. So uh, Lord, we pray that you would bless your medical servants as they do your work and do your healing through their hands. Uh, Lord, we pray for the doctors and the nurses and the assistants and administrators and everybody in between uh, who serves our community, uh, who serve our community so diligently, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would bless them, protect them, and that you would do your miraculous healing through their hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord.